You've got questions? O'Reilly Auto Parts has answers. Need a pro you can trust? We've got that too. No matter what you need, our professional parts people have the training and expertise to help you do things right. Deep automotive knowledge. Just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. History as it happens, April 30th, 2024. What is Zionism? With ink on Balfour Pact still wet as waves, these waves of the Mediterranean Sea, Jews pour into the wasted and sandy acres of ancient Palestine. Partition had brought a new flare up in the strife between Arab and Jew. Politically, the conflict appeared to be settled. In actual fact, it had only just begun. Zionism's elder statesman at long last sees his years old dreams of a promised land come true. When that great Zionist leader, Dr. Weissman, set foot on the shores of Israel. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist, and I'm a Zionist. On college campuses nowadays, opponents of Israel's war in Gaza are denouncing Zionism, the foundational idea of the Jewish state of Israel because they see it as a form of violence or a justification for the subjugation of Palestinians, not just today, but for the past century. What is Zionism? What were its goals and what are its future challenges? Has it become another word like socialism or fascism that is used to cudgel one's opponents? That's next with Ian Lustig as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. I actually think most of the protesters, as far as I've been saying, are both of those things. They are both, they see Zionism in pejorative terms and they genuinely are horrified by what's happening in Gaza. So I think that both of those are true of most of the protesters. You know, Zionism, preparing for this discussion, I, I started thinking, well, what does Zionism mean? And I actually came up with a list of 27 different meanings of the word, or 27 authentic meanings of the world. And one of them is that it is a meme today for something that fits all the wrong categories. Zionism began as a national liberation movement based on emigration. Jews left Europe to establish a homeland, to escape anti-Semitism. Zionism in Palestine was also about settling the land and transforming it from a country with an Arab majority to a country with a Jewish majority. And in 1948, this goal was achieved. It was an expected outcome given what came before it. Listen to this British Pathé newsreel in 1936. An unnamed Arab man talks about his people's grievances against the British government for facilitating Zionist immigration to what was then the British Mandate of Palestine. The main case of the Arabs is against the British government's policy in Palestine, a policy which, if continued, will surely have as a result the replacement of the Arabs by the Jews. This policy is not only contrary to the pledge given by His Britannic Majesty's government to the late King Hussein in the year 1915, for the establishment of a completely independent state, but is also not in accordance with the fourth point of President Wilson's 14 points, calling for the self-determination of all people. Against all principles, the British government imposed the Balfour Declaration, which is abhorred by all Arabs in the Near East. And on favoring the establishment of a national home for Jews, forgot intentionally to safeguard the civil rights of the non-Jewish population. The Arabs, who decided on a general and a complete strike until the total and immediate stoppage of Jewish emigration is brought about and until the government introduces an essential change in its present policy. So I'm sure you noticed that he mentioned the Balfour Declaration there. The Zionist leader, Chaim Weizmann, is credited with convincing Alfred Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, to support the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine rather than Uganda, which was Balfour's initial idea. A Jewish homeland, not necessarily a state. Again, this was the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Today, if you're paying close attention to what's happening on some college campuses at pro-Palestine demonstrations or anti-war protests or, as some refer to them, anti-Israel demonstrations, 
Students are denouncing Zionism, not as a national liberation movement, but as they see it, a violent colonial project, as this young woman said in an interview with K5TV in Seattle. We are here to call on the United States to stop for all foreign aid and military support to the Zionist regime. The United States is now planning to back an all-out war and fund the genocide of Gaza by the Zionist occupation forces. Or there was this strange chant at Columbia University in New York about Zionists entering the Gaza Solidarity Encampment. We have Zionists! For supporters of the Palestinian cause, Zionism has no positive connotation. It means the displacement or expulsion of the Arabs who were once the majority in the land that became the Jewish state of Israel, and since 1967 have been living under military occupation in the West Bank. You may recall last October, I produced an episode titled 1948, the most listened to episode of this podcast in 2023. It was about the origins of today's conflict, and we're going to return to those historical roots right now by asking, what was Zionism? What is its future? My guest for that October episode was Ian Lustig, professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He has been writing about this subject for more than 40 years. His first book was published in 1980, Arabs in the Jewish State. And more recently, published in 2019, Paradigm Lost, From Two-State Solution to One-State Reality. It analyzes the political demise of the two-state solution. Ian Lustig, welcome back. My pleasure. All of my episodes, Ian, are linked to current events, what's going on now. So maybe we can start just briefly about what's happening now on college campuses and the way the word Zionism is used on the part of protesters, uh, some of whom may be genuinely distressed at what's happening in Gaza, others, and they may be a minority of the protesters, who use Zionism in a very pejorative way. We want to put an end to Zionism, etc. What are your thoughts on, on the way the word's being used now? Well, I actually think most of the protesters, as far as I've been saying, are both of those things. They are both, they see Zionism in pejorative terms, and they genuinely are horrified by what's happening in Gaza. So I think that both of those are true of most of the protesters. You know, Zionism, preparing for this discussion, I, I started thinking, well, what does Zionism mean? And I actually came up with a list of 27 different meanings of the word, or 27 authentic meanings of the word. And one of them is that it is a meme today for something that fits all the wrong categories. That was not true in the 1960s when I could say I was proudly a Zionist because it was the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. Of course, everybody wanted to be in the national liberation movement at that time. Right now, people want to be decolonizers. So Zionism presented itself since it began, depending on how you see it, it could have begun 2,000 years ago, but really it began, I think, most reasonably in the mid-19th century, because it offered certain groups of Jews ways of being Jewish that served their interests and that attracted respect from the outside world. So when traditional Jewish life in Europe began to break down in the 19th century, because of industrialization, because states became mass participatory states so that elites could use anti-Semitism to rally vast numbers of voters. A lot of changes intellectually broke down the walls of the ghettos, and you had young Jews who wanted a new way of life, and everyone around them was saying the way to live a good modern life is in your own nation in your own nation state, not in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, not in the Russian Empire, not in the German Empire, the British Empire, have your own country, whether it's Slovakia or it's Slovenia or it's Poland or it's Ireland or it's Hungary, the Jews have to have their own. So most peoples all over the world, they look for changing respected categories and then they see themselves in those categories. And as the categories change, they see themselves differently. I was very uh, somewhat amused, but not at all surprised to see recently a whole book written about how Jews are the best example of an indigenous people ever trying to return to their land. Well, you can go back to Herzl and others and say, well, no, Jews are the first nation. They're the first race. They are the most important religion. They are the epitome of what it means to be human. 
Each of those formulations was advanced when that standard was being used internationally to grant rights to groups. So Zionism has had its day, in a way, as a formula that attracted support for Jews. And now, because of the categories that are popular, it's become a code word, as I said, for just about everything that's in the wrong category. Instead of national liberation, it's a settler colonial movement. You know, there's a saying in, in Judaism by Hillel, one of the famous rabbis, these and those are the words of the living God. And it's true that Zionism both can be seen as a national liberation movement of the Jewish people and as a partially successful settler colonial project. You know, when I hear people chanting against Zionism, people who are offended by that say, well, they're saying Zionists, but they really mean they mean Jews. These are anti-Semites. On the other side, they say, no, we're actually against Zionism. But in their view, Israel today is a Zionist state. It is a Zionist project. And in their view, that means basically taking over all of that land and cleansing it of Arabs. Well, let's break that into two. Sure. First of all, is Zionism the same as Judaism or is anti-Zionism the same as anti-Semitism? And then what does Zionism mean, no matter what the answer to that question is? Let's go back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries when Zionism was getting going. And it was a minority movement in Europe among Jews. Let's say that a million and a half Eastern European Jews left uh, Europe for Britain and the United States between 1885 and 1914, the outbreak of World War I. Just keep that in mind, a million and a half. At the same time, only 50,000 went to Palestine. Half of them left. So it's a tiny minority, even of those who chose to emigrate as opposed to staying or becoming socialists and so on. So it's a minority movement. But in response to it, its biggest enemy were the rabbis. Almost all Orthodox rabbis in Europe and just about all Reform rabbis, especially the United States, opposed Zionism. I mean, really strongly opposed it as a sin or as the most dangerous threat to Jewish life. Now, would we say that all those rabbis who were proudly and explicitly anti-Zionist, were they anti-Semites? No, of course not. Yeah. So the idea that historically you would say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism is a reflection of ignorance of what it actually is. As an indigenous people, Jews in Poland, Jews in Russia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had a pretty impressive level of tolerance for minorities, by the way, these Jews didn't have a direct connection to what would become the British Mandate of Palestine, did they? They were from Europe, born, raised in Europe for generations, right? Well, right. But it's also true. I mean, I did my own genetic background with my saliva. And I, my ancestors came out of the Middle East and went into Russia and then at least through my mother's side and went back into Eastern and Central Europe. And I think that's true. Uh, that genetic profile is probably true a lot. So in, in a sense, I see some of my background as coming from the Middle East. On the other hand, all Cro-Magnon species, our entire species, came out of Africa through the Middle East into Europe. So it doesn't really tell us that much. Indigenous is a very strange term. Native Americans, we, we often are honoring indigenous, the tribe that used to live here, let's honor them. But many of them were settler colonialists also. The entire Lakota Sioux, for example, displaced other tribes that were in what are now Kansas and Nebraska, by settling them and annihilating them and expelling them, it's very difficult to fit the romantic image that, well, we were the pristine people here before everybody else, and we had a wonderful life before the bad people came and pushed us out. What's funny about that, Martin, is that that story that I just told, once upon a time, there was a wonderful land where we lived we had a wonderful culture. We tilled the land. We had our songs. We loved in nature. And then the bad people came and pushed us out. And now, a long time later, after our culture was almost dead and destroyed, a few brilliant visionaries and folk singers discovered the old ways. And in their name, we are going to liberate ourselves and our land. That's the sleeping beauty theory of nationalism. And every single nation uses that theory, including Jewish nationalism. They all use that theory. And each one of them advances itself as the most special chosen people with the best language, the most beautiful land, the most persecution, whether it's Hungarians, Irish, Chinese, Italians, French, English, Jews. What's just funny is that the most common, typical thing of a nation is for it to think of itself as absolutely special and unique. 
nationhood, different than a state. A nation is a yes. commonality among people based on culture, race, ethnicity, religion, language. So here is a, a book, Ian, that uh, I have referenced many times since October 7 and over the years by the late William Cleveland, A History of the Modern Middle East, The Emergence of Political Zionism. Throughout the centuries since their dispersion from Palestine by the Roman conquest of the first century, the Jewish communities of Europe kept alive the idea of a return to the Holy Land. And this addresses your point. Palestine occupied so central a place in Jewish religious culture because of the belief that the establishment of the Kingdom of Israel after the Exodus represented the fulfillment of God's promise to the Jews that they were chosen to complete their destiny in Zion. Historical memories of the reigns of David and Solomon intermingled with aspects of religious belief and ritual to create a sustained vision of the ultimate redemption of the Jewish people through a return to the Holy Land. So, right. so that is one capsule view of what th thinking about Jewish history is. It's not the one that most rabbis had throughout the centuries. For example, the greatest of them, uh, Maimonides, said Messianism, the idea that we're going to return and conquer the land, that's the most dangerous idea he could think of because the rabbis were horrified by what the attempt to revolt against Rome did to the Jewish people. It destroyed most of them because the Romans were so barbaric. The rabbis also distrusted messianism, even though, and that's what that is, it's messianic. When God sends the Messiah, then the Jews will be able to return to the land. What Jews were not supposed to do, according to the rabbis, is to bring themselves to the land. That was called the chikata kates, pushing the end. It was sort of defying God's will. Almost all the Orthodox rabbis were opposed to Zionism. They saw it as the chikata kates. And what Cleveland is doing there in that particular passage is giving you what the Zionist position is, that is the sleeping beauty theory of nationalism. And it's the same theory that the Irish nationalists use or any other nationalist movement yeah. uses. I think this discussion is important because like so many words today that have an ism on it, the definitions get stretched to the breaking point. And it's not that critics of Zionism don't have a legitimate point, but it's important to not only go by the definition that the critics have established. We're trying to uh, recover a historical definition here. And how did Zionists refer to themselves? Well, uh, let, let's, let's make a distinction here, sure. Martin, between Zionism as a movement before the state was created to bring Jews to Palestine, not necessarily to create a Jewish state. That was something that came later under Jabotinsky and Ben-Gurion in the 30s. But if you look at Buber or many, many others, Hachad Am, the idea is to have a large, prosperous Jewish community in the land of Israel. What the political framework of that was not necessarily the most important thing. After all, the, when the judges during Samuel's time and Gideon and Deborah, they did not have a state. And God, when approached by Samuel in the book of Samuel, Samuel asks God, make us a king. The people want you to want a king. And God says to Samuel, why they want a king? That's a terrible idea. The king will take their men for the army. They'll take their money for taxes. No, I'm not going to make a king. Samuel goes back to God and said, look, I told the people what you said. And they said they still want a king, just like all the other nations have a king. So God says, oh, you, you, they insist on a king. So you see that guy over there? Saul, make him king. But it was not something that it was not even God's first choice. Uh, so that's just an interesting take. Zionism is unusual in its first incarnation, partly because most national movements have a state already. It's a monarchical state or a religious state or a fragmented state, but it's a state already. And some of the elites in the state use nationalist ideas to mobilize an army and mobilize people to expand or build the state. Very few national states are built the way Zionism tried to do it, whereas you start with a nation and you don't have an organized state. You have to build it. Zionism said it was constructing what it called a state on the way. Now let's shift to the after 48. Once you have a state, what do you mean when you call it a Zionist state? Because it's not the protesters who came up with that. Israel still calls itself yeah. a Zionist state. So what does it mean by that? 
if you look at, uh, at what they mean by that, it means not just expanding territorially. Many Zionists didn't want to expand territorially. They wanted to stick with the old 1967 borders. Some of them did and saw that as part of Zionism, to liberate or redeem all the land of Israel, including Jordan and, and southern Lebanon. But other meanings mean bring in as many Jews as possible into the country, or it means Judaize the country inside. So limit the amount of land that non-Jews are controlling or Arabs are controlling. Limit the number of Arabs in the country. Or it means make the country more religiously Jewish. Or it means transforming Jews from occupations that they used to predominate in, in the diaspora into peasants, into farmers, into workers. That was an older version of Zionism. Or even to go out and protect Jews. Uh, is another form of Zionism. But, but Israel sees itself not only as a Jewish state, but a very particular kind of Jewish state, a Zionist state. And therefore, since it says that, people have a right to say, well, I would feel differently about Israel if it were not a Zionist state, yeah. if it were just a regular state that wasn't trying to transform itself in these ways or transform the world. That's a legitimate argument. People can have different opinions about yeah, it. Yeah, because I think what some protesters are saying today is... This form of Zionism right now is incompatible with coexistence with Arabs. Yes, and I share that view right now. I have for my whole life uh, thought of myself as a Zionist. For a long while, I was willing to say, look, the best we can do is to have a two states, a Jewish state, which does injustice to the non-Jews inside its borders, and a Palestinian Arab state in which Jews won't have as completely equal rights to Arabs. That's not ideal, but that's the best we can do. I fought for that for a long time. That was a version of Zionism. Then I wrote my book and uh, I believe it's no longer possible to divide the land. It literally is not possible anymore politically. And for that reason, I started to think of myself as a Zionist because I favored a large, prosperous, and secure Jewish community in the land of Israel. But then I realized that the word Zionism has become so fraught yeah. that the aura around the word is so complex, has so much mimetic force that I can't communicate what I mean by using it. So I no longer am calling myself a Zionist because what I really want is equality and freedom for all who live between the river and the sea, which, by the way, it's not just the slogan yeah. of people who are chanting on the encampments. It was the slogan of the right-wing Irgun yep. before the war that used to sing a song that I could sing about making Palestine free. Free, that's what we will do. And they meant from the desert to the sea. That is including Transjordan, not just from the river to the sea. So I do want to return to 1881 here and the importance of that moment uh, had to do with a, a Russian czar. But to your point about what it's called and why you don't call yourself a Zionist anymore, I saw a poster stuck up in my neighborhood here in Washington, D.C. recently that said, Zionism equals racism equals Fascism. Now, I don't think that's correct, but generally speaking, my view of this, and this is a bit of an abstract view, is that no nation should be based on one ethnicity or religion. I want to live in a multicultural, multi-confessional, multi-ethnic country like, well, the United States of America. Not that we don't have our problems with racism and all these other things, right? But, you know, you can't abstract the reasons why Israel was founded as a Jewish state because, well, then, then you miss the whole point. It was done because the idea in Europe, we will never be able, even if we assimilate, we will never be, a, be safe. We'll never be able to fully be emancipated without our own homeland, our own place to be, right? I mean, that's essentially it. Yeah, well, yeah, and the key word that Zionists used when they argued with Yiddishists, with people who wanted to form national autonomous communities in Europe, uh, who were socialists, Jewish socialists, with rabbis, is they said, we are just not living normally. Normal people have a place where they're the majority. Maybe there are minorities everywhere, uh, elsewhere, but they have at least one place where they're a majority. And Jews don't have that. If they had a place where Jews were a majority, if we had that, then we wouldn't look so weird to the Gentiles. And we would just look like the French look in Germany. Now, that meant that beginning where the Jewish country was was not so important. In fact, Herzl suggested Uganda. I have posters about Galveston being the place where the, or Argentina. It was only later that the uh, movement 
started to focus all of its attention on Palestine. That's interesting. Uh, 1881. Tsar Alexander II is assassinated. His son, Alexander III, blames the Jews and reimposes anti-Semitic policies that his father had relaxed. I mentioned before that some places in Europe, Jews were emancipated. They had different levels of tolerance, depending on which part of Europe we're talking about here. The result of the crackdown on Jews uh, under Alexander III was emigration from Russia. Some went to Palestine. About 7,000 reached Palestine in 1882 alone. According to Jonathan Schneer, whose book here, the Balfour Declaration, I'm holding. But many more went to America to flee what were the Russian programs. So, Ian, is this an important inflection point in this story? The 1880s in Russia, which started to drive, literally drive Jews for their safety out of Europe, at least Eastern Europe. Absolutely. I, I mentioned at the beginning of the program the crisis of Jewish life in Europe, the Dreyfus trial in France in the 1890s showed that mass democracy actually threatened Jews in ways that they didn't realize, even in the West. But in the East, the policies of the new czar that you mentioned were encapsulated with a slogan of one third, one third, one third. One third of the Jews will be killed, one third forcibly converted, one third expelled. So the mass emigration was also a reflection of what Jews usually did when things got rough. They left Spain for the Mediterranean. They left Germany after the Crusades for Poland. And now they're leaving Eastern Europe for for where? Not for Palestine. Some went to Palestine. There was a very self-selected group. Now, you mentioned 7,000 in the, in the one year early in the 1880s when the wave of pogroms really burst out. But some of them were not really Zionists. They were religious Jews who were going to Palestine. Once the rabbis, though, realized that this Zionist movement that was forming had political and cultural and non-religious objectives that would subordinate and destroy what they thought rabbinic Judaism was, they came out vociferously opposed to Zionism. So those figures are a little little mysterious. I gave you the figure of 50,000 Jews who left Eastern Europe for Palestine between 1885 and 1914. About half of them left Palestine once they got there. That left 25,000 compared to a, a million and a half in the same period who left for the United States and Britain. It gives you the idea not only of how small the Zionist movement was, but how dedicated, how unusual the Zionists were. They were people, usually young, rebellious people who were extremely politicized and angry often with their families. And when they got to Palestine, they were out to prove that they were not going to be subservient Jews like their parents. They were going to take it out on whoever was around, including Arab peasants who had no idea who these people were. Because yeah, uh, there had been the Jews point. in that part of the world, but they were not European Jews. Or they were very Orthodox Jews who were there waiting for the Messiah to come. They had no idea about transforming Palestine into a Jewish country. And they lived only in the four, the four holy cities. As opposed to the Zionists coming there in the 1880s and 90s wanted to settle the land, take land away from Arab farmers or buy a large tracts of land from Arab landowners and really transform the country. That's why the Ottoman Empire, which controlled, formally controlled Palestine at the time, passed a law that said that Jews were welcome, persecuted Jews were welcome in the entire empire because they were thought to be good tax-paying citizens, except for Palestine. Because in Palestine, based on petitions the Ottoman Empire was receiving from Palestinian Arabs, the Jews wanted to change the country. So that's the one place that the Ottoman Empire said they couldn't go to. Here we get to settler colonialism. Because the Europeans were really in control, uh, had so much influence over the Ottomans, controlled their debt and so on, they could decide whether Ottoman law was enforced in Palestine, and they generally sided with Jews, allowing them to break the Ottoman laws. In that sense, Zionism, not unlike many other nationalist movements, took advantage of its relationships with imperialism, European imperialism, in order to advance its objectives. And that's what Herzl was all about, was casting Zionism as an instrument in the hands of European imperialism that would protect Europe from Asiatic barbarism. So every politician always looks at what he wants, takes what he's doing and portrays it as if it's exactly what his audience most wants to hear. 
So that's key to understanding Zionism. It just wasn't immigration. It was immigration with the idea of transforming the destination, in this case Palestine, into something new. Yes, and that's the difference between settlers and immigrants. Yeah. In fact, it's very interesting, Martin. In Israel, there's a traditionally those people who came to Palestine, Jews, in order to upbuild the country, are called olim. Those who come up, they, they perform aliyah. They are honored because they're Zionists, and usually they're European Ashkenazim. When the uh, Mizrahim, when Jews came from Arab countries to live in Israel, they often were not referred to as Olim, but as immigrants, as if they came, yes, just to live somewhere else, but not as real Zionists. So it's been a struggle inside of Israel over the status of Mizrahi immigrants, of Jewish uh, immigrants from uh, Middle Eastern countries, as to whether they have the same status as Ashkenazi, as European and American immigrants, who are portrayed as having come with a Zionist purpose in mind and not just seeking refuge. And the issue of settlers and colonialism today, right? So some folks who don't appreciate what they're hearing at these protests will say, listen, hey, someone born in Tel Aviv yesterday, they're a citizen of Israel. They're Jewish. They're not an immigrant. Their family's been living there for a long time. Maybe the people who are populating the West Bank and taking Palestinian land in the West Bank can call them settler colonialists. But this term is often interpreted if it's not meant that way. It's interpreted by those who hear it as using a broad brush to describe all people in Israel today as settlers. Right. The thing about settler colonialism, I've written about this, is that there's much, much more variation within the category than people appreciate. You don't learn very much by saying a country is settler colonialist. The United States is a settler colony. Canada is. New Zealand is. Bolivia is. Argentina is. New Zealand is. Australia is. South Africa was. Algeria was for a while. Kenya was. I mean, Rhodesia and as I pointed out, the Lakota Sioux, actually, when they ruled what is now Kansas and Nebraska, they were also settler colonies. So what do we know when we say Ireland? I mean, is the British rule of Ireland. What do we learn? We learn that settler colonies is the use of settlers to extend the domain of an existing state, or in the Zionist case, to actually build a state somewhere where it didn't exist before in their name. But what happens with settlers so often is that they turn on the country that tried to use them. So the American Revolution was an example of settler colony that turned on its creator. The Boers in South Africa did the same thing to the British, right? It's very common. In a way, I just wrote something about this, that Israel was created, the Zionist movement was created to help Jews solve their European problem. And the Europeans helped the Jews do that because they wanted to solve their Jewish problem, get them out of Europe. But as is usually the case with settlers, the project turns on its progenitors. In the Israeli case, we're finding, for example, that instead of Israeli behavior making American Jews feel safer, it makes them feel much less safe. They feel attacked. They feel under pressure because of uh, what Jews are doing yeah. in the predicament that was created by a Zionist movement that well, was partially successful. That's one of the ironies here is that Jews have not been particularly safe in, in the state of Israel. Now, it's not right to blame victims of wars for their own lack of security. We're talking about 1973, 1948, Israel was attacked, the new state, by what, five or six different Arab states. But you get what I mean. As, as it's turned out, Israel has not been a very safe place. This is very complicated. Yes. We talked about 48 before. Yeah. There was a civil war in Palestine for six or seven months before the Arab states invaded. The Arab states did yeah. invade. By that time, the, the refugee problem, they're already in the process of being created, is a very complicated yes. uh, story. The difference between 73 and the Hamas attack was that the Hamas attack was an attack on territory that had become Israel, even though it had been emptied of Arabs in 1948. But the attack in 50 years ago, when I was in Jerusalem, actually, at the time, that was an attack by the Egyptians and the Syrians on occupied territories occupied in 1967 that had not were not part of the state of Israel. So this iteration of war was a much deeper shock than the shock in 1973, even though both of them were quite a shock. Theodore Herzl, First Zionist Congress in 1897. I want to get to that, but first, uh, 
you mentioned a word before, alia, A-L-I-Y. Alia. Alia. All right. Thank you, Ian. There were several of these alias. They were waves of immigration. The first one was mostly Russians and Romanians. I'm taking this from Jonathan Schneer's book on the Balfour Declaration, Russian and Romanian Jews. He says they were not farmers. And again, this is the 1880s. But many of them burned fiercely the will to show the world that Jews could till the land, could root themselves in their own soil and live upon it. They would demonstrate that they were not natural ghetto dwellers. Within a few years, they had established four agricultural colonies near Jaffa, plus one in the northern part of the plain of Sharon and three in Galilee. At first, the results were unsurprising. No colony prospered or even seemed likely to survive. Determination, no matter how strong, was no substitute for knowledge and expertise. But then the great Jewish philanthropist stepped in, Baron Edmund de Rothschild of Paris, members of the London branch of his family, and other wealthy co-religionists. Their subventions provided the necessary cushion when crops did not grow or having grown did not sell. They provided much else besides. Funds for equipment, tools, seeds, teachers, schools, doctors, and administrators. And of course, they gave funds to purchase land in the first place. So is this what you were describing before about how influential Europeans helped the Jews leave? They wanted them out. That's, that's one example of it. But it's such a very interesting history. The, the bigger way they helped is not understood by very many people. And I'm going to try to explain it quickly to you. As I said, the Ottoman Empire was under the thumb of the European imperialists because the Europeans had lent the Ottoman Empire tremendous amounts of money in the mid 19th century when the Ottomans tried to make their state a modern state without actually democratizing. So they were deeply in debt and could not pay back the banks in Europe. So what the Europeans did in the mid-19th century is tell the Ottoman Empire it had to change its laws, especially its land laws, so that land would not be owned by the sultan. It would be owned by individual proprietors who then could be taxed. Since they owned their land, the idea is they would invest in it, and the taxes it would become more profitable, more taxes would be collected, and the loans in Europe could be repaid. What that meant in Palestine was in the 1850s and 60s and 70s, sharp land speculators went around to the peasants and said, they're changing the land situation. You're not going to be able to deal with your landlord anymore to live on your land. You have to deal with the government. They didn't explain to them that you will be owning the land. They just told them you'll have to deal with the government. And peasants never like to deal with the government. So the peasants signed away They didn't realize what they're doing. They signed away title to the land and gave it to these absentee landowners. Then when the Zionists came and wanted to buy land, they never could have bought it if the Sultan had owned it. But because of the European pressure, they now were able to go to the absentee landowners and buy large tracts of land, remove the Arab farmers, and then put Jewish farmers on it, subsidized with European Jewish capital. So when the Zionists say they paid good money for the land to the owners, they are telling the truth. When the Arabs say the Zionists displaced the peasants from their land, they are also telling the truth. You have to understand the way the imperialism created the opportunity for a very strange settler project to get a toehold and then build itself in Palestine, that's much more important than the ultimately failed projects of Baron de Rothschild. Those were kind of showcase plantations that didn't do very much. Books by people like Gershon Shafir show is that what we know of is Zionism, which means collective ownership of the land by Jews, not allowing Arabs to own land in the country for more uh, or to lease land for a long period of time. That was the result of what these settlers needed to do in order to survive. They could not compete against Arab labor, so they discriminated against it. And those institutions did not come from Europe. They were built up in Palestine as these desperate Zionist kids were trying to find a way that they could survive without leaving the country. And the way they could survive is to discriminate against Arabs. And so ultimately, the roots of settler colonialism are visible today in the antagonism over the land question between Palestinians and Israelis. I mean, this is fundamentally a conflict over land. Uh, there's religious aspects you know, and nationalist, when, when, but it's about the land, yeah. And who, who gets to live here yes. and who gets to decide 
whose property, whose houses stand here. Yeah. You know, I say Gaza is a part of the state of Israel because you can tell where a state is by whose government decides whether a building can stand or not. It's clear that in Gaza, there's only one government that decides that, and it's situated in Jerusalem. The Zionist Congress, the first one, 1897. At this time, around the turn of the century, we're a half century away from the Holocaust. We're still 15 years away from World War I, which was another important chapter in the development of Zionism. Turn of the century, 1900, roughly how many Jews, I'm not even talking about Zionist Jews, roughly how many Jews are living on the land? Around About one out of every 10? It's like a 90, 90 to 10 percent? It, oh, before World War I? Yeah, Arab majority? Uh, one out of ten, maybe a little, maybe one out of nine. One, one out, out of, of eight. One, okay, one out of eight. So still very much an Arab majority country. Oh yeah. At the Zionist Congress, Theodore Herschel, very important figure there. Is this where they decide that it has to be Palestine? I mean, what was the significance of, of this Congress? First of all, if we're talking about the eighteen nineties. I'm yeah. sorry, the proportion would be less. Less. I, I thought we we're he- headed to World War One. Right. But let's talk. That's about, only about fifteen uh, years later. But go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the Congress. Herzl added something that the Zionist movement did not have until that point. What the Zionist movement had was all these intellectuals, these scribblers, these very detailed analyses of the tragedy of the Jewish question, these outlandish arguments, outlandish in the minds of most rabbis, uh, about how Jewish life had to be transformed in order to save it. But what it didn't have was a way to deal with geopolitics. How do we approach the governments of the world? And here's this well-read, aristocratic-seeming Jewish uh, writer from Vienna uh, with a very charismatic posture who was affected by the Dreyfus trials and was actually able to communicate with the elites of the world, with the kings and emperors. Jews, on one hand, this was unusual. On the other hand, it was very similar to how Jews had operated for hundreds of years by having a few representatives of themselves who weren't religious, who had dealings with the counts and with the kings, could get special breaks or protections for the Jewish community. Here was a man who seemed like in the tradition of false messiahs. Maybe he is like the Messiah. And he became a really revered figure through the Jewish world because there was so much suffering in Eastern Europe and so much fear even in Western Europe. He attracted a following that Zionism had not had until that point. But he himself was not in touch with the feelings of most Jews. So in 1904, in the third or fourth Congress, when he recommended that Zionism accept the offer of the British to have a country in Uganda where there would be free immigration of Jews, the Zionist Congress said no to Herzl. They said no You may think that's rational. Many of the Zionist theorists think that that's a good idea. But the the folk, the simple Jews that we need to attract in mass, they won't connect to Uganda. They'll go to the United States. They'll go to Britain. We can't get them to go to Uganda. We can only get them to go to Palestine by making it a very romantic return to what the Jews were like in the past. So Herschel actually died of a broken heart very soon after that refusal by the Zionist movement to follow his suggestion. But he was a very important person. As I said, he went to the German emperor, to the Ottoman emperor, and whatever they wanted, he would tell them he would produce. So to the Ottoman emperor, he said, the Jews all over the world will pay off your debt if you let us settle Palestine. To the Germans and to the British, he said, if you help us settle Palestine, we will create a rampart against Asiatic barbarism, and we will spirit the penniless Arabs out of the country. He didn't ultimately succeed in getting a charter anywhere except Uganda, partially, which was refused. Uganda, man. So how history would have been different, right? (laughs) I actually don't think that would have worked out. Yeah, I don't think so. The British probably would have withdrawn it quite quickly. So there are waves of Jewish immigration to Zionist immigration. Not, Not all of them were Zionists. So Jewish immigration and many Zionists among them to what would become the British Mandate of Palestine after World War I, leading all the way up to World War II here. There was an Arab revolt in 1936 to 1939 that we discussed on a previous episode. So the British are supporters of the Zionist cause. Prime Minister David Lloyd George is a backer. Now, we talked about how or whether Zionism could ever be compatible with coexistence with Arabs. The key syllable there, co, 
meaning there are two sides. How did the Arab majority feel about the immigrants who were coming? I mean, it does take two here, right? Were they intolerant of what was happening? Was it unrealistic for them to expect that no one would immigrate, or I don't want to say no one, but less immigrants would show up during this period? And this is where the, the whole settler colonialism thing comes in. They felt the same way that most populations feel when alien groups come into their territory. What are you doing here? in such large numbers, or the way the Crusaders appeared to the Arabs when they came, or the way the white men appeared to the Indians. You're strange. What are you doing here? What? Do you think this is your country? If they're like the old Jews, there's no big problem. Uh, There's so much, there's more similarity between Muslims and Jews than Muslims and Christians. There was actually good relations on a religious and cultural basis in the four cities. But then as it became clear, as I said, that these Jews wanted to transform the country, Then what you get are petitions to the sultan saying, hey, these are not the same Jews we're used to. We don't want Zionists in the country. They're taking our land. They're transforming. They're going to come in mass. It's going to be a non-Muslim country. They were actually quite perspicacious. And what's interesting is Jabotinsky, the leader of the right-wing Zionist movement, he was one of the only Zionist leaders who was willing to be honest about what Zionism in the 1920s wanted. He wanted a state. And he said, there are no peoples anywhere, not the Papuans, not the Red Indians of America, no normal people would ever tolerate alien settlers coming into their country. So we cannot expect the Arabs, they're not willing to settle for a mess of pottage. And don't think of them so lowly. They're a normal people. They will demand the same thing we would demand if we were them which is opposition to alien settlers who want to transform the country. So what was his solution? And this really was the solution that the Zionist movement as a whole adopted under Ben-Gurion. It said, we don't really have anything to offer the Arabs that they would accept, that we would accept if we were them. This is pre-48. This is pre-48. This is in the 1920s. But we need them to accept us in the long run. So how can we manage this? We manage it by against their will. Building a community and a state so strong that they can't destroy us, they will learn through defeats, military defeats over a long period of time that we cannot be destroyed. And then like it or not, they'll have to live with us. And at that point, we will compromise with them. We will either divide the land or we'll share rights because as Jabotinsky and even at ben Guyan said it sometime, though I don't believe him, we do not want to dominate anyone and we don't want to be dominated. But what happened, Martin, this was called the Iron Wall strategy. It was successful building an iron wall, building a Jewish army, defeating Arab attacks repeatedly that were all to be expected, and splitting the Arabs between the extremists who said, no, we will never agree to anything, and some who said, look, better half a loaf than nothing. It was at that point that, according to the strategy that Jabotinsky and Ben-Gurion outlined, The Zionist movement was supposed to reach out and negotiate with the moderates, those ready to compromise, not because Zionism was right in their eyes, but because it was inevitably there. And what happened was that inside the Zionist community, instead of maintaining the willingness to compromise, it became more and more extreme, wanting more territory, feeling we've been attacked by the Arabs for so long, why should they get anything? And that's the real tragedy. It may have been a Likely, but it was a tragedy. Every time Zionism was in reach of making a deal with the Arabs by sacrificing some of its bigger ambitions, the more extreme version within Zionism took over. And now you have the most extreme government Israel or Zionism has ever had. And that's what has produced the inability to consider the two-state solution as realistic anymore. And Netanyahu's never really supported a two-state solution. No. So therefore, the slogan of everyone should be free between the river and the sea, and whether you call it Palestine or you call it Israel, that's the challenge now, in my view. It's one country from the river to the sea, but it's not a country of equality. Depending on where you live and what nationality you are, you have completely different rights inside this country. And that's what the struggle is about, what this country is going to be about in the future, what's it going to be based on, not whether they're going to be one country or three countries or two countries.
In the run-up to World War II, it's been said, well, there was the Arab revolt that was crushed in the late 1930s. So that was a real setback to Arab ability to resist what was coming. But uh, it's been said that Arabs weren't well organized. There wasn't really a coherent Arab nationalism. It was more tribal, uh, whereas the Jewish groups and the Zionists were well organized. And they had a lot of help from powerful foreign countries like the British, that Jewish units fought alongside British units in World War II. Therefore, uh, the Jewish groups had an advantage when it came to winning the war of 48. Yes. uh, Remember, I I mentioned earlier that Zionism is really an example of a national liberation movement. Every nationalist movement, whether it's Algeria or it's Palestine or it's the Arab nationalist movement in general or it's the Irish nationalist movement, goes through stages where you go from a traditional peasant society with traditional peasant attachments to places, but not to an image of the land as Ireland or Hungary, okay, only to their particular valley. And then you get to a point where the traditionalists are in charge, the, the Catholic priests are running the Irish movement, not political parties. And then you get to a, a stage where actually secular politicians have replaced the priests, and now they're appealing to all men and women, and they have an image of being ready to die for the country, not just for your village. So every nationalist movement goes through these phases. And Zionism, produced by some of the most politically developed and sophisticated minds in Europe in the late 19th century, had already launched itself beyond traditionalists. In fact, they were fighting the rabbis. The rabbis were the traditionalists. But in Palestine, as in most of the Middle East, nationalism was still going through its stages. And we see in Palestine the same stage of formulas of what's called primary resistance, where peasants are outraged, their land has been taken away. Then traditional elites petition the sultan in the name of their uh, traditional interests. Then gradually clan and sectarian and local leaders start to mobilize to compete who's going to act in the name of the people as a whole until finally you build a movement like the Zionist movement that represents or tries to represent the whole population. And you are right that one of the advantages that Jews had in Palestine was that they were super well organized. Remember, tens of thousands, maybe 20, 30,000 immigrants in the first and second Aliot before the end of World War I that were so important, they came without families. Their whole lives were the organization, were socialism, were Zionism. 23 hours a day, they were organizing and working on their project. Most of them wrote memoirs. That's why we know so much about this. Compare that to the way traditional Arab society was. It was nothing like that. Highly mobilized, highly energized, highly disciplined, well-resourced from outside relatively to anything that could happen inside of Palestine. And you start to see the advantages versus disadvantages of the two sides as the conflict developed. I just recently watched Lawrence of Arabia, which again is a movie and it's probably a little bit dated, but you get a you get a touch of this, at least the British attitudes towards the Arabs. A couple more questions, Ian. This has been great, by the way. After 48, I just want to share something with you from uh, William Cleveland's book again. After 48, many more Jews start to immigrate to uh, Sephardic Jews included to Israel, the new state of Israel. Cleveland writes here, the emerging Israeli polity also had to deal with the presence of 160,000 Palestinian Arabs who had remained within the post-1949 borders of the new state. The Zionist program, he writes, had not envisaged the existence of a large non-Jewish minority population in the future Jewish state and the question of how to accommodate Israeli notions of social justice with the exclusivity of the Zionist ethos was a vexing one for the Israeli leadership. I'll, yeah. I'll also add that I learned from uh, Jean-Pierre Filiou recently that it was early as 1949, David Ben-Gurion floated the idea of bringing some of the Palestinians who had been expelled back into the new state of Israel to try to calm this, that he knew would be a problem, ongoing grievance. But uh, Wow, I'd love to see that reference to the Ben-Gurion idea. The only one I know of relevant to that is for a brief time when Ben-Gurion was entertaining accepting the Gaza Arabs, the Arabs who had been expelled into the Gaza Strip, assuming that Gaza would be annexed by Israel. 
That's probably the same thing, and maybe I'm getting it a little bit wrong. I'll, I'll share that essay with you from Jean-Pierre okay. Filiou. But, but yeah. actually, the quote yeah. from Cleveland, I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if he cites my book at that <laughs> point, because that's exactly what I wrote about in my dissertation. Zionism never thought about what, what we're going to do with the Arabs who are living in this country. Not because they had a, a nefarious plan, they just they were so obsessed with the idea of Jews ruling Jews that they never thought about this. So in the midst of the war, though, Ben-Gurion had developed in the 1930s an idea that when war came, it would be possible to reduce drastically the number of Arabs in the state. How did he get this idea? Because in 1937, the Peel Commission, which was a commission of British investigators, recommended something drastic to solve the problem of Palestine. Is let's divide it into two countries, a small Jewish state and a larger Arab state. That was acceptable to Ben-Gurion as a first step to what he wanted, but it was not acceptable to about half the Zionist movement. It certainly wasn't acceptable to the Arabs at all, and it was ditched, withdrawn by the British. But there was one part of the proposal that Ben-Gurion was transfixed by. There was a clause in Peel's report that said that to make this work, Several hundred thousand Palestinian Arabs would be transferred out of the Jewish state into the Arab state. Ben-Gurion had never imagined that the world would allow that. When he saw that the Peel Commission was ready to approve it, he stored that information away, had it written about by an advisor, and in 1948 realized that in the midst of the fighting, he could reduce the number of Arabs drastically who would be in the Jewish state, even as he increased the territory by expelling them, and that the world, he thought, would tolerate this. And he was right, but he didn't reduce, he didn't get rid of all the Arabs. There were 160,000 approximately, actually a few, uh, uh, we don't have to go into the exact number, who were either allowed to stay or actually driven into places from which they could not flee because the Israeli army already had it surrounded. Weizmann called this, quote, a miraculous simplification of our task. He, he was surprised at how successful Ben-Gurion had been in this regard. But it still left 12% of the population at that time as non-Jewish. Now it's about 25% non-Jewish, 22% of whom are Arabs. And this is a big problem for Zionism, but not nearly as big as the problem it's become because the West Bank and Gaza Arabs are now under Israeli control like the Arabs in 48 became under Israeli control. But unlike the Arabs in the Galilee, these Arabs have not been given political rights. But now that they've been effectively annexed, the struggle in Israel is over. What do we do with them? There are 7 million Arabs now living under effective Israeli control, along with 7 million Jews. So it really confronts the country with the dramatic question of whether it wants to be an Israeli version of an apartheid state where half the population rules another, or it wants to be a messy, multi, you know, multicultural country where everybody has access to the political arena. It's a very difficult question because it can't be abstracted from the history here and the reason why there was Zionism to begin with. The idea that anti-Semitism was so embedded in European society that we have to find another place to live. Now, that proved prophetic because we know what happened from 1939 to 1945 under the Nazis. But we have to also consider the rights of all these Arabs, as you mentioned. So maybe we're just at an intractable spot here. We'll wrap up with this, Ian. The future of Zionism. If there has to still be something called a Jewish state, where there is a Jewish majority, then you can't have uh, the messy, multicultural state that you describe that some people envision. Let's, let's just be careful about our... our uh... Sure. Usage of language. There is now no Jewish state if the definition of a state is that the majority of the people who live there, living there are Jewish. That's simply not true. In fact, a plurality of Arabs are 550,000 non-Jewish non-Arabs in the country and about 7 million Jews. If you ask, is there a state where the vast majority of those with political rights are Jewish, the answer is yes. It's very possible to have a country, we have it now, which is one state, which is Jewish in the sense of who controls the state, but is not Jewish 
in the sense of what its population is. And that's the struggle. In the long run, when you have a situation like that, whether it's a white America after slaves are freed, can it remain only white or a male-dominated America when it's only men that have the vote? Can that remain forever? Well, the history of the Western world suggests no, it cannot remain that way forever. It's going to change. How it changes, what time frame, how ugly it's going to get before it does, that's another question. Yeah, it raises the question of what would happen if Arabs did get power, if they would then treat the Jews uh, the way they've been treated since 1948. We would have retribution, right? Yeah, I don't know what would happen if women got power in the United States. Would they treat the men this that way? Well, why is that funny? Because we never imagined women would take power as women. And that's not the way this works. Some women support some political factions, some women support us. Arabs and Jews would be mixed the same way. Jews and Jews hate each other more than many Jews hate or fear Arabs and that's vice true. versa. Yeah, there are many, many Jews opposed to the current policies of right. Netanyahu. They would much rather have democratic, progressive Arabs as allies than Netanyahu and vice versa. So yeah. don't let's think about this as Jew versus Arab, man versus woman, black versus white. These groups split because they have differences within them and they have different interests and different opportunities to align with one another. Yeah, well, those nuances get lost as the stories are Absolutely. conveyed over the, the media. So that's that's yeah. on me to, to think a little bit more critically here. I said that would be the last thing. One, one more brief thing about the eschatology. You shared an essay recently written by Israeli journalist Shlomo Eldar, Shlomi rather, who interviewed people who are close to the leadership of Hamas, who say that the Hamas leadership, a faction of real fanatics, end times prophecies. They wanted to destroy Israel and start a new order. And you also have fanatics in the Israeli government right now. I'm not making anything up here. I've, I've read and listened to what they've said about what they want to do, say, with the West Bank. Just as we don't think that all Israelis share the views of uh, ben Gvir or Smotrich, the two radical and racist, frankly, ministers, Ben Gvir is the Minister of Internal Security, uh, who just objected in a cabinet meeting to the fact that too many Gazans were being arrested. Why aren't they just killed? Yeah. So we wouldn't say that those are the, the opinions of all Israelis. What this article that was distributed showed that the people in charge of the attack have these apocalyptic views, but that the Hamas leadership outside the country, in fact, many of the Hamas leaders fled Gaza because they knew what was coming and they couldn't stop it. So the question is, why, why does this crazy faction in Israel get to be in the government? And that same question is, why does this crazy faction among the, in Hamas get to be in charge? What are the mistakes that the other sides made that allowed this to happen? Rather than imagining that Israel is Itamar Ben Gvir or the Palestinians are uh, Sinwar and the current leadership of Hamas in Gaza – which is not the leadership of Hamas elsewhere. And I'll share a link to this essay about Hamas's leadership in my weekly newsletter. You can sign up for that at historyasithappens.com. And we thank Ian Lustig for returning to the podcast. You know, I think I need to do an episode about the years of the British mandate. There's more to this story than just Jews and Arabs. There were British colonial overlords in charge of Palestine, and, well, they left it a mess. On the next episode of History As It Happens, our favorite ism, fascism. No, not again. Can't I drop this subject? Maybe this will be our last episode about it ever. The Fascism Distraction, next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 